series. I was commenting to Connie that this is the first time anyone's asked to, for me to speak for so long and a long time. So I hope you don't regret that later. I'm gonna take full advantage of it. Um, let me share my screen here. See if I can do it right this time. Okay, where'd it go? Share, okay, I'm one slide ahead. Okay, so, um, so first of all, before I go on, I should say that I have changed the title of my talk a little bit, um, just to clarify the emphasis. The, the, the title was put in about a couple months ago and as I've been working on the data, um, I've shifted the, the focus a tiny bit. It's, I'm still pretty much talking about the same things, but I will focus a little bit more on um, multi-stakeholder platforms from the perspectives of indigenous peoples and local communities. And uh, just a short outline of my talk, I'm gonna do a little introduction talking first a little bit about kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, a quick look at the big picture on climate change, transformational change, inequality, and then why uh, we're studying, we did the study of multi-stakeholder platforms and uh, IPLCs, and then I'll go into the research itself. So first of all, just a little bit about me. Um, my work is pretty much at the intersection of research policy and practice perhaps with a dose of activism, given that I work on issues of justice and so on, um, which is not the same thing as being a full-time researcher, academic, or a full-time practitioner. I have a full, I have a multidisciplinary background with an undergraduate degree in environmental science and a PhD in what was more or less an interdisciplinary social science, looking at what I would consider transdisciplinary problems. And so for me, it's pretty clear that the complex problems that we're facing today are not gonna be solved through a single discipline. So what we need more than ever is it coming together across the kinds of disciplinary boundaries that while often you know, providing requisite depth can also restrict our understanding of the problems. But also what, from my perspective, what people may see in the academy can be very far from what policymakers are seeing and can be very far from what practitioners um, are seeing and so on. So I'm not sure if this makes my position unique or just very confused or both, but um, that is pretty much where I'm coming from. So second of all, kind of looking at the big picture, you know, from my perspective, everything we're doing now is facing, we're looking at this crisis moment on this planet. Everywhere we look, where anyone's serious about climate change, there are calls for transformational change. And there's no question that we need to change the way we live. Um, and while this talk of transformation is very appealing to those of us who see that fundamental changes need to be made, it also raises a lot of questions. What kind of transformation do we need? Of what and for whom? Who will win and who will lose and who decides? So looking at how people are defining transformation can see across, uh, I, I basically pulled these from some uh, some big institutions. I've been part of a climate, in, uh, climate investment fund transformational change learning platform. So they've been working on definitions, the NAMA facility, GIZ, SDC transformations forum. And I probably threw in a couple words that I found elsewhere as well. But transformational change is usually described as something that's fundamental, strategic, disruptive, catalytic, and complex. It aims for large scale sustainable shifts in systems, institutions, markets, and power relations, and toward a carbon neutral, climate resilient, just and equitable future. But the just and equitable is not often included in these definitions. And in discussions we've had in the learning forum, for example, some people very feel very strongly that this should be included. And there's also a very strong current of people who feel like it's, it's spreading the interest the, the goals too thin or getting into areas that aren't the priority. So I think these are really um, fundamental questions and maybe a little bit concerning for me to not have just and equitable as part of these definitions. Mm -hmm. There's also a growing sense of urgency. Uh, for example, 1t.org calls to act at unprecedented speed and scale. And what do we know about urgency? I mean, urgency has always overridden the slow and messy processes of participation in democracy, of assuring the rights and livelihoods of indigenous peoples and local communities. So how do we address the climate crisis hand in hand with the crisis of growing inequality and increasing concentration of wealth? And how do we assure that certain trade-offs are not on the table? 
So just a comment about inequality before we go on. I wanted to highlight, um, in case there are any doubts, <laughs> that there's a major problem with inequality, growing inequality, poverty in the world. Um, I wanna highlight the Land Inequality Report commissioned by the International Land Coalition. It's really worth a read. Um, it's just some quotes from the launch. It's, it's called Land Inequality. Actually, I can't really see the title. Oops, my own slide is hidden by information at the top here, but um, at the something of unequal societies. I'm sorry, I can't actually read it on my screen. Um, so some quotes from the launch. Land inequality is significantly higher than previously recorded with data reporting a 41% increase compared to traditional census data. Historically, methods to measure land inequality, such as the Gini coefficient, exclude vital pieces of information, such as the value of land, multiple ownership and landlessness, as well as the control a person actually or an entity has over the land. So um, as one of the uh, ILC staff wrote, these findings radically alter our understanding of the extent and far reaching consequences land inequality has, proving that it's not, not only is it a bigger problem than we thought, but it's undermining the stability and development of sustainable societies. So for me, this question of inequality is absolutely essential to everything we do going forward. Um, so now I will move into the research I wanna talk about today, uh, multi-stakeholder process and IPLCs. Everybody loves the multi-stakeholder process, right? What's not to like? Um, so first, just to clarify some terms, when I'm talking about uh, multi-stakeholder forums, the ones I'm referring to, well, they can refer to uh, platforms, partnerships, processes, forums, and they're ones aimed at improving land and resource use practices towards more sustainable alternatives. So I am focusing on land and resource forums, though we have drawn some, uh, some uh, knowledge from looking at other forums in other arenas. So a multi-stakeholder platform for our work, which I will interchangeably refer to as MSFs or MSPs, is a purposefully organized interactive process that brings together a range of stakeholders to participate in dialogue, decision-making, or implementation of actions, seeking to address a problem they hold in common, common or to achieve a goal for their common benefit. And by IPLCs, just to clarify for this talk, I'm gonna use this as a shorthand to refer to indigenous peoples, local communities, traditional communities, smallholders and women in these groups. Um, and I'll just call them IPLCs or, or land, local peoples as a shorthand. While of course I understand that there's also many differences between um, or among these groups as well. Um, but this is just to sort of give us an overview. So why study multi-stakeholder platforms? First of all, virtually every major effort to address land and resource sustainability in Africa, Asia, and Latin America includes some kind of multi-stakeholder platform partnership or process or calls for it and says how incredibly important this needs to be. Um, I've already noted that these complex global problems are transdisciplinary. It seems obvious that some kind of multi-actor, multi-sectoral negotiation collaboration is needed across people's and interests. There's also half a century of experience, research and analysis on participatory processes, even on the term stakeholder, um, but I'm not gonna get into that today. That itself is, is a complicated term. But what we see in practice is still pretty naive and simplistic. Generally, there's a failure to draw on or even give a salute to past experience. Hence, ideas tend to be devoid of theoretical grounding or understanding of the results of research coming from all of this incredibly rich past. So forums are imagined as if we're all bringing puzzle pieces to the table. We're not playing poker, we're playing, we're putting together a puzzle, right? We're all in this together. Um, so this is sort of the, the wall, we're all in this together, we have to solve this together imaginary or imaginaries, because I think these are two different things. So the research here that I'm gonna talk about today draws on a prior project on multi-level governance, which found everywhere we went a common call that we needed to coordinate better as a solution to unsustainable land and resource use. There was very little attention given to the reasons why people weren't already coordinating um, or the fundamental differences in interests and worldviews behind on the one hand, development, conservation and sustainability and on the other hand, indigenous peoples, land rights, gender, and so on. So of course we know that people can come together across common goals, uh, around common goals. We're capable of identifying land and resource problems, finding common ground, negotiating solutions. Eleanor Ostrom and many other researchers who followed her 
have produced extensive research on the commons that shows that we can come together. But when we're talking about these invited spaces, something more needs to be done. And all of the MSFs that I'm talking about here and virtually all of the ones that I see being promoted around climate change, landscape restoration, or these transformational change perspectives are invited spaces. Invited spaces are not grassroots driven or organized. They're those into which people as users, citizens, or beneficiaries are invited to participate by various kinds of authorities, be they government, supranational agencies, or non-governmental organizations. And you can see that definitions from almost 20 years ago. So this has been around for a long time. Um, and the, another point about this is that past experience suggests that such spaces have great difficulties with regard to equitable representation and voice. So naturally not everybody involved in solving climate change or landscape restoration thinks that addressing inequality or poverty or rights of IPLCs and women in these groups is an equally important problem, but I argue that if we're bringing IPLCs to the table, then addressing inequality, poverty, empowerment, livelihoods should be part of the bargain. So though this is a very normative statement, I'm certainly not alone. Uh, addressing climate change while addressing poverty is not, while increasing poverty, excuse me, is not an option. Every major global donor or multilateral agency has safeguards and do no harm policies as a minimum and many go beyond this. For example, pushing free prior and informed consent policies, at least for indigenous peoples, um, securing land rights and so on. This is fortunately becoming more and more accepted as a priority. Um, also IPLCs off, operate an estimated half of the global land area. Sometimes they see 25% to 65% on this. 25% appears to be under indigenous peoples if we can trust the data, mostly without re recognized or secure land rights. So shouldn't they be partners in this? We're talking about land and resources. And then of course there are instrumental arguments based on research showing people are more likely to take ownership, adopt new rules, et cetera, et cetera, if they're part of the process of making them. And that's from Ostrom and many others. And of course, many other points could be made from the justice perspective, the burden of solving problems people, uh, indigenous peoples had very little to do with creating um, and various other practical perspectives. So now I'll move into the research itself that I'll talk about today. Um, the research we did falls under C4's Global Comparative Study on RED, on RED Plus, which is, um, you're probably all aware if you're at this forum, Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. It was funded primarily by NORAD over the past 10 years. And as I mentioned in a previous phase, we worked on the study of multi-level governance in five countries, Peru, Indonesia, Tanzania, Mexico, and Vietnam. And what emerged from that was this new round of study of multi-stakeholder forums specifically for the reasons I already explained above. So we started with, a, started with a series of literature reviews, one of which was a realist synthesis review published in World Development, which drew on you know, some, a lot of these old cases of, of participation that show kind of what, what is working for equity and what is not. And then the field research focused on a four country study of 13 subnational multi-stakeholder forums. There was also one national forum in Brazil that I won't talk about today. As I said, all of our cases are participatory forums to support uh, more sustainable landscape management. They're very varied, but they have that piece in common. The countries weren't randomly selected. They were part of, uh, they were defined by the broader research and the funding by NORAD to Peru, Brazil, Indonesia, and Ethiopia. But we weren't trying to get a sense of all forms or get a, even a representative sample, but just try and understand the complexities mostly within forums themselves. We chose subnational are arenas with the one exception in Brazil in order to be closer to the geographical location where the specific changes were being targeted. And by multi-stakeholder, we required there be at least one government actor involved in addition to a community, an NGO, et cetera. And that was to separate out something that would be purely project-based or could be purely project-based and have little connection to institutional structures that might sustain it over the long term or institutionalize the outcomes. And also because of the growing interest in subnational jurisdictional approaches to climate change, for example, and um, because of my own past work on decentralization, decentralization policies. So within each country, we did a national scoping of forums to look for the ones that met our criteria, which also included they 
could be new, but they had to have existed for at least a year. They had to be more than just a few meetings. It had to be a, some, some kind of institutionalized process, though it could have a beginning and an end. Um, they could have ended as long as the people were around to still be able to interview. And we were looking within countries at a variety of experiences, you know, which ones were people saying were great, which ones not so much. Um, so in the end, we ended up with these uh, 13, well, 14 here, you have the Pepe Sedam, which is the National Brazil Forum as well. Forum as well. There were four in Brazil, uh, Indonesia and Peru, and two in Ethiopia. They range from these ecological economic zoning processes, which were mandated by government in Brazil, that's Acre and Mato Grosso, uh, Green Municipalities Program in Pará. In uh, Ethiopia, both programs were basically focused around participatory forest management. In, Kaliman, in uh, Indonesia, we had a real variety looking at um, a palm oil initiative, a regional council on climate change, a regional peatlands restoration team and an integrated uh, uh, watershed management investment program. Um, in Peru, we had uh, the Mesa Piazzi, which is a forum to set aside, to trying to set aside areas for the protection of um, indigenous peoples in initial contact or isolated peoples. In Madre de Dios and San Martin, they were both, um, again, government mandated uh, committees, co-management committees of protected areas, and uh, in Ukayali, a forest, um, community forest management uh, roundtable. So the, again, the central government one is not included here, and you'll see from the data in a, in a minute that the central Kalimantan and East Kalimantan drop out because they don't have any indigenous peoples in the forums at all. Um, so we had a whole series of questionnaires for uh, for finding, for doing the work. So I, don't, I hope you can't hear the drilling behind me. My neighbors just moved in and are drilling in the walls. Just so, a little bit, but it's not too bad. I'll let you know if it- Okay, let yeah. me know if I should get my headphones on and maybe that'll help a little. Um, so we did background literature review on participatory processes as the framing and training for the field teams. We, uh, in addition to the field questionnaires, we had some basic national, regional, and forum data that we collected. We had specific interview protocols for key informants who could talk about the context who were not part of the forum. Uh, we had particular interviews for forum organizers, for participants, and for non-participants, as well as some focus groups for indigenous peoples in a few places where that seemed to be really useful. Um, the, we called the, the organizer questionnaire the TOC questionnaire, the theory of change. So trying to understand, did what was their theory of change? Why did they organize this forum? Why were they bringing people there? For what purpose? Um, that's a different a different talk, <laughs> and a, a paper is actually coming on that out on that shortly. Uh, the the last method that we used, aside from just the the interview questionnaires, which were open ended with a few closed ended questions, I'll present a couple of the closed ended questions here today. We always ask follow up questions um, for, with open ended answers to understand the results. The the, the photo you see is the Q method, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it consists of laying out 42 statements about multi-stakeholder forums that respondents then, what we had them do was group them first on the ones they agreed with, the ones they felt neutral about, the ones they, they dis, what I, did I say di agree or disagree, but disagreed, agree, and neutral. And then you lay them into a grid and you can shape the grid however you want, but the more, um, the more spread, the more you force people to really highlight the ones they most agree with and most disagree with. Um, so Q method allows you to quantify, to do quantitative analysis to build a typology of beliefs or perspectives. It doesn't require a random sample. It works really well with small numbers of respondents, um, but just getting the variety of understandings. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're not, I'm not gonna present the Q analysis results because um, we're actually working on that for the indigenous people, which is a nice sample size, but the global size is way too big for Q. Um, so I'm just gonna look at sort of agreement and disagreement across some of the questions. And again, after laying out their cards, the interviewees were asked to explain their responses. So quickly, the research participants, I don't know, if, do you see the same thing I do that you can't actually see the totals on the side of the screen? Yeah, we can see the totals. You can, okay, because yeah. I have all the people blocking the, the side there, so. Um, so this table shows the distribution of the IPLC interview respondents by forum. 
Um, it's also divided by male and female. You can see there aren't very many women in general in these forums, unless there's a real effort to get women there, or that's a particular focus of the forum. Um, there are also, as you can see, not a whole lot of indigenous peoples in some of these forums. We didn't interview, we weren't always able to interview everyone, um, but many forums did only have one or two um, indigenous or local people representatives. Um, on average, there were 40 people interviewed per case site, roughly 20 to 25 um, participants, aside from the non-participants and uh, key informants, if ensuring a spread of actor types. So again, as you can see, we have one to 14 people uh, interviewed as um, IPLC, depending on the forum. Um, so again, in, in the two Indonesia cases have dropped out because there were no indigenous or, or local community representatives and not atypically, uh, we found a lot of forums that, that were not part of our cases as well as these two that sort of felt like NGOs represent indigenous peoples and local communities, which is obviously um, problematic. So um, of course the answers by forum are more important than the totals in the end because of the diversity with the very high numbers in the Indonesia cases and low numbers elsewhere. Um, so, okay, and then we have the Q participants. And so not everybody is the same in these two sets, but most of the participants did both the uh, Q and the interview. Um, I'm, what I'm going to focus on in this is the 50, 51 Indigenous people local community interviews, but I also have some of the data from the others so you can kind of just get a comparison of how the people we interviewed are responding to these, to these questions. And you can see there's a real dominance of government in the forums that we looked at um, and the people we ended up interviewing. So the main questions that I'm going to talk about for today, um, I actually probably don't need to read through them all because we're going to go through them one by one, but they're looking at um, in per perceptions of equity and of the forum itself, as well as uh, some questions more generally about the potential of forums. So the first two are really about equity in the forum. Um, the third one is about uh, whether they can be a transformative solution, whether people see them as a transformative solution. And then the Q statements are really more, uh, much more about people's impressions of what MSFs do um, but they still reflect, obviously, to some extent, people's experience in forums themselves. So I'm going to go through these one by one and just uh, share some of the answers and some of the findings to these questions. So on this first one, to what extent did the MSFs address power differences in the forum? We ended up recoding the results a little bit because there was a first group that replied both yes and no, who really wanted to emphasize they didn't think anything special needed to be done to address equity in the forums. So we weren't expecting that, <laughs> didn't ask the question the right way perhaps, um, but we found that seven of the respondents uh, felt this way. And just to note, six of those were male. Um, so I find it hard, less common would you find women saying there's no need to address the problems with um, inequity in a forum. Um, so the results uh, were recoded. Uh, the spread, of course, is more important than the, the totals. IPLCs from only three forums seemed overall positive about the actions taken. Those are the three in blue. And in two forums, the only responses, again, we only had one interviewee in these, in these cases, um, the responses were negative. They not, not, not enough was done, and it should have been done, as opposed to feeling that it wasn't needed. So obviously, it's hard to draw conclusions on one question with so few cases in, in, a, in some of the uh, settings, but in combination with the other results, of course, we start to see some patterns. Um, so let's see. The, uh, so it's also worth noting there's another fairly large group of people that did not answer the question at all. And most of those were women in West Java who felt just uncomfortable with the question, commenting things like, well, I just went because my husband went, or I sat at the back of the room and I never said anything. Um, and things like that, or I went to cook. <laughs> I cooked the meal for them. So that's interesting of itself. Um, so, okay, so the next question, to what extent did or might the MSF have an impact in leveling the playing field more generally? So we thought, oh, in, we wanted to look inside the forum and then outside the forum. And here we actually start to see, um, well, there's some similar responses with the previous question, but we also start to see the spread of responses a little more clearly. and. Basically, I'm just gonna give you a summary of these 
our conclusions from these two points, as well as the, uh, the, the other data, is that Jambi and Acre stand out with particularly favorable opinions of, by the IPLCs, and Mato Grosso and Pará have particularly unfavorable views. And we can see why when we look at the broader data set, and I'll give a short summary on those cases in a moment. Um, we also see that opinions tend to be pretty varied and or tempered in most of, um, not all of the other cases. And every case has at least one person saying that more should be done. And eight cases have someone saying very little or not at all to at least one of the two questions. So, um, and of course, one thing I just want to remind everyone, these are the answers of people participating in the forums, not the people not participating. So we obviously have a bit of a bias already towards people who decide they should be there for some reason. So that's important to remember. Um, okay, so what make Jambi and Acre stand out. So the MSFs in these two cases are very similar in some ways, but in important measures, um, sorry, very different in many ways, but in, they both took important measures to address inequalities and ensure participation. In Jambi, the MSF was aimed at protecting a community forest and focused mainly on knowledge, knowledge sharing and capacity building. It was based on a bottom-up adaptive collaborative management ACM method which is about building trust about among participants as a key important key part of the process. And since the closure of the MSF, which actually closed over a decade ago, progress has continued in the securing of land rights for the community. Um, and there's an article coming out about that soon. So just for full disclosure, this was one of C4's first ACM project. ACM was a method designed by staff and this project took place in the early 2000s and is still a method that um, people are using, which I'm happy to talk about if anybody wants to ask a question about that. So almost all interviewees, 11 of 12 in Jambi, considered that the MSF had a positive effect, especially in terms of gender equality. Um, one female participant noted, women's participation used to be so unequal, not representative. Men ignored us in discussions. They said that we were useless, but the MSF motivated us and facilitated discussion where we participated equally. Um, participants in John B. also mentioned that other measures such as inclusive invitations, capacity development led to more equality beyond the MSF. So Acre's forum, as I mentioned previously, was part of a mandated state process to develop a land use plan for the entire state. It was developed in a context where the state government already worked very well with indigenous peoples. It was politi politically committed to inclusion and took significant efforts to support it. Participants said that in the MSF, everyone was heard equally. There was a good representation of different groups. And one of the interviewees highlighted an ethno zoning process that was set up separately in response to indigenous people's concerns. Interviews also noted that indigenous movement and indigenous rights were strengthened as a result of the MSF and that it created a participatory process for indigenous people to engage with different actors in a way that had not been done before. So this included taking this as part of this ethno zoning, it took the meetings out to rural areas where the indigenous peoples were located rather than always making them travel into the meetings in the city. And it was the only place in the sample that did this. Um, one interviewee commented, however, that this process, the progress may not have been so much due to the MSF itself, but because of the context, Acre's pro-environment and pro-rights context. So the context in which it was embedded was already one of a strong IP and social movement with strong alliances and the, uh, with the left-wing workers party government. And Acre's government advocated for the rights of indigenous and traditional peoples and promoted a forest-based sustainable development which they called Florestania, or I've seen it translated as Flores citizenship. So opposite kinds of cases, Mato Grosso and, and, and Pará, these cases were viewed far more critically um, and the People, the forums were much less interested in building trust or addressing indigenous people's interests or rights. The forum in Mato Grosso was in fact the same government mandated land use planning that was carried out in Acre, but in an entirely different political context, which is also detailed by Gonzalo Travar in, a, in an article that'll be coming out. We have a special issue of the International Forest Review coming out with a lot of these cases. Um, so in Mato Grosso, the comments we see are pretty different than those from Acre. Uh, one participant even called the Z, the Zonificación uh, Ecological Economic Zoning, a Machiavellian action of the state government. The representative of in, traditional populations perceived that the main structural issues 
that is invisibilization of traditional communities were not being discussed in the Z Commission because it would expose various under the carpet problems such as wealth concentration and illegal land grabbing. In Pará, I mean, this is a particularly interesting case because it's gotten a lot of international and national uh, press as a great project. Um, so lots of interesting things happening there. So in this, the, this is the Green Municipalities Program. It focused on the commercial and private landowners who were the primary drivers of deforestation, largely to the exclusion of IPLCs. Though the program received accolades nationally and internationally, the case study researched unearthed a very different perspective. Interviewees describe this as greenwashing, depicting the program as a wolf in green sheepskin. According to a non-participant uh, non interviewee from a university, the PMV included few spaces where participants could think about the concept of equity as it did not include a number of actors that were important for regional development, such as social movements, regional universities, and rural smallholders and communities that continued to suffer to a lack of, due to a lack of state policies and address their challenges and constant threats of expulsion and of murder. So three grassroots movement representatives representing indigenous peoples, quilombolas and family farmers claimed that they had not been invited to participate in the forum and that it had not in any means, by any means represented their interests or considered their agendas. So moving on to the next question. Um, we also asked in the interviews, uh, MSFs have been proposed as a transformative solution for more equitable and effective decision-making processes. Based on your experience, do you agree? The responses were overwhelmingly positive. 100% of interviewees in six forums and the vast majority in a seventh all agreed. This included Jambi and Acre, as you might expect, but it also included all the others except Pará, Mato Grosso, and Madre de Dios. And San Martín did not answer the question. So what we see from this is that in spite of very mixed experiences in existing forums, expectations and hopes are very high. So why maybe are people participating or see these as important? These are some quotes that uh, are not from our research but are came out of events or that we saw in events while we were conducting this research. First of all, there's a strong learning element, uh, learning element you can see on the left-hand side there and being at the table is better than not being at the table, which you can see in the quote from Roberto Borrero on the right side. So, and of course, in some cases, it's very clear that being invited to the table is a huge step forward compared to the past. Um, and again, it's important to remember that we're hearing from people who are participating in MSFs. And though we did require, we did interview a number of people who did not attend in our non-participants, non-participant interviews, the ones with indigenous people in local communities mostly refer to not knowing about the forum, not any particular opposition to them. Um, though there are a few people who refer to not being allowed to speak or they, so they wouldn't bother to go or to issues of distrust. So now we'll move on to the Q statements. Um, so in this second set of data, the Q statement, we looked at agreements with a series of statements and here I'll present the results across all the actor types. Um, but what we're really focusing on is the general opinion of IPLCs and also so in a, in a little bit of comparison with the other groups though we understand you know this this is weighted by group and so on but it's it really is only indicative it, it's not a, a random sample by any means it's but it is a snapshot of a massive data set and I think it's useful to to look at some of these patterns so these questions again are about MSFs in general not the MSF in the case study but you can see how responses might reflect one's own experience in some cases um, and we do have the tables broken down by case but I'm not going to show it here because they're pretty overwhelming. Um, but in general people thinking are thinking here of what they think is possible or ideal coming from their experience um, as with the transformation question above. So in this one uh, MSFs in MSFs all participants feel like equals with a real say in their futures. In general, um, quite positive responses. Uh, interestingly, donors, NGOs, and academics are on average a bit more optimistic. Uh, they're on the higher end of the average than IPLC's government and the private sector, though overall, again, responses are pretty positive. Um, perhaps if this actually represents a real difference, practitioners and communities that are more embedded in these power struggles um, see them as a little bit more problematic, perhaps, than the academics and the and the NGOs who have a little bit more idealism about them. The least, up, the least agreement was from Pará and Yucayali and most agreement from Acre and San Martín. So the second question, 
statement here is MSFs can empower IPLCs and or previously marginalized groups. Um, so similarly, there's overall optimistic about from the, this from the groups, though with a similar, pa similar pattern as above and particularly high averages among academia and NGOs, there's less agreement on this potential from IPLCs themselves, as well as the private sector, which have the lowest percentages. But this is particularly interesting in comparison to the question above about whether MSFs can be a transformative solution um, for more equitable decision-making where there were overwhelmingly positive responses um, from indigenous peoples. Here, perhaps surprisingly, Pará and Mato Grosso were the only ones with 100% agreement um, on the potential of transformational change. Remember, there were six different forums that gave, um, that gave their full agreement. And here it's the two most difficult ones, which is just kind of interesting. But it does raise some interesting issues in terms of the different responses. Um, is there a disconnect between equitable decisions and empowerment between the forum experience and a hypothetical? Is it a combination of these? Um, maybe it has to do with the point about being at the table, being better than not being at the table. Um, but translating translation, a transformational change with more equitable decision making with empowerment obviously is not so straightforward. Um, so also it's interesting to note in this case, San Martin was the least optimistic on the previous question about feeling equitable and or feeling like equals and the, um, and here it's the least, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> the least agreement with this one. So again, we shouldn't be simplistic and think that being equals is the same as empowerment. It's the same as having a potential for transformation and being optimistic about one does not necessarily mean being optimistic about the others. So the next question, <coughs> statement, sorry, is no matter, how, no matter how the MSF is designed, powerful actors will always find a way to dominate the conversations held. And, uh, here we see um, the highest agreement from Pará and San Martín, zero agreement from Ukayali and the two Ethiopia cases. Fortunately, <clears throat> there's large disagreement here overall. Um, but again, the highest agreement is from IPLCs and from academia. So perhaps academics can relate to the, uh, the idea of not being listened to, <laughs> not being heard. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. So the, the fourth question, and I just have one more after this, is MSFs create opportunities for the less powerful to link with potential allies. Um, so I find the results here for IPLCs to be particularly disappoint disappointing and worrisome. On the one hand, all three interviewees from Pará and Mato Grosso agreed with this point, which is great in spite of their difficulties. They do see this as a place uh, to build allies. But on the other hand, overall, there's far less agreement than you might expect to find. And that contrasts with the opinion of, of all of the other groups. So shouldn't these MSFs be the meeting place precisely for IPLCs to be finding allies? Um, so up to this point, we've been talking mostly about voice, feeling like an equal, voice is not being dominated by someone else, or someone else's voice, voice is feeling empowered. But one of the most important elements of making the voice of IPLCs and women more powerful is finding allies. So I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. The last statement I'm gonna talk about here is that IPLCs would be better off fighting for their interests through social action, collective action, their grassroots organizations, rather than through the MSF. And this is perhaps the most striking of all with regard to the future of MSFs as a strategy for change and whether IPLCs see this as their best option. There's a clear difference among the groups here with by far the highest agreement coming from IPLCs. One third think that social action is a better option and less than half disagree with the statement. So just for some stock taking here, um, first of all, we see there's clearly some good forums and some bad forums for IPLCs and a lot of mixed and maybe contradictory experiences. We can glean some ideas from the results of what makes for a forum that's perceived as more equitable, and I'll come back, back to that in the discussion in a minute. There's also significant widespread optimism on the potential of MSPs for addressing inequality and improving decision-making processes. But to some, to some extent, IPLCs do appear to be a bit more skeptical than the other actors, in spite of general optimism about the potential of MSFs to assure voice and empower IPLCs. And remembering again, that these are all participants of forums, not those who have chosen not to attend or to leave or to stay away entirely. 
But now I want to focus mainly on the last two statements above. Those two refer to the allies and to the alternative of social action or collective action outside the forum. These two points are incredibly important. They link us back to the literature, which I haven't talked much about yet, but I will now, um, and to important research and theory on participatory processes. So first of all, uh, remember that these are all invited spaces or spaces of induced participation. And as I quoted previously um, from Cornwall, past experience suggests that invited spaces have great difficulties with regard to equitable representation and voice. Now, Mansuri and Rao conducted this monolithic uh, World Bank review of participation in over 500 large scale top down, what they call induced local participation processes in the development arena as they were implemented by government and donor funded, including NGO participatory programs. They found that absent some kind of affirmative action program, groups that form under the aegis of interventions tend to systematically exclude disadvantaged and minority groups and women. With regard to multi-stakeholder platforms specifically, they found that deliberative forums are, are more effective when they are an integral part of the policy making process and where higher tier governments are committed to ensuring greater citizen participation. Most projects, however, did not promote accountability, monitor progress effectively, or build a learning environment to adjust and improve the course of action. Now, the kinds of forums we're talking about aren't large scale development projects, but I think these lessons about accountability are very relevant. And frankly, I'm not sure that they're all that different either in, in many ways when you get on, on the ground. It's not enough to promote participation without also promoting accountability. And fundamentally, we need to assure that these participatory spaces are accountable to the IPLC members. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is needed here to build accountability? Accountability depends on the exercise of countervailing power. Countervailing power, countervailing power is defined as a variety of mechanisms that reduce and perhaps even neutralize the power advantages of ordinarily powerful actors. Jonathan Fox studied five of those top-down participatory development projects from the World Bank, Mansuri and Rao study, to find out how a very small number enabled participation in a way that built countervailing power. He identified an important, important feature of the projects that were most successful in fostering counterpower that's relevant to the study. They had support for their own scaled up social organizations, such as second level uh, ethnic federations beyond the community level and collective land title. Other important findings include the need to identify targeted political opportunities, a failure to target gender inclusion or to support transparency and accountability reforms or human rights protections. Fox also finds that voice from poor local communities is not enough to challenge more powerful actors the voice of the normally excluded has to be actively encouraged. And by finding allies from within the state or other citizens groups, they can build countervailing power. They may need interlocutors to help bridge power differences. So this is why for me, the question above was so concerning. If only half IPLCs saw the forum as a place to find allies, while the other actors did see it as such a place. So are the IPLCs not seeing potential allies or are the others not understanding what it takes to be an ally of indigenous peoples and local communities? And with regard to collective action, we have another quandary. Forum organizers, and probably many of us, see the forums themselves as spaces for collective action. For example, the interviews with organizers, which aren't presented here, but are also coming out in a journal article, found that at least one interviewee in all but one of these forums recognized that there were power differences, but most often simply believed that bringing people to the table was the priority and would address the inequalities. But this is not the collective action for countervailing power that the minority or marginalized groups need. So multi-stakeholder forums are based on ideas or ideals of pluralism and participatory forums are not necessarily part of representative de democratic processes or the normal ways in which accountability works in a democracy. So if we wanna bring IPLCs to the table, if we want them to stay at the table and be part of negotiated solutions for transformational change, if we wanna take equality, empowerment and justice seriously, 
And if we want, as I said at the beginning of this talk, to address the climate crisis hand in hand with the crisis of growing inequality and increasing concentration of wealth and assure that certain trade-offs aren't on the table, then we need to think more strategically about MSPs and give much more attention to what it means for marginalized groups to have a place at the table. So what is the arena of collective action? If we're bringing people together to, to put together a puzzle as equals, then the forum may in fact be that arena. But if we're playing poker, then the collective action arena has to be somewhere else. So we need to think more strategically. Why are we bringing people to the table exactly? How does this fit into a well-defined theory of change? How do we build accountability structures into the MSPs and specifically what is needed for these processes to be accountable to the needs and interests of IPLCs? Let's remember what stood out about Acre and Jambi, though I can't claim to know if this re represented counter power because that would have been a different study. But in Jambi, the forum was launched from an action research approach that's strategic to support bottom up decisions, capacity building and trust building. It's notable, also notable in Jambi that there was a higher number of IPLCs. And in the case of women in particular, there were targeted strategies for empowering women. In most of these forums, IPLCs and IPLC women in particular, a very small portion of the people at the table. And apparently, again, they aren't always identifying allies. In Acre, the forum was part of a much broader political agenda. Representation appears to have been important in Acre. The people at the table were key social movement representatives. Acre also took the forums out to the field where they could engage more people directly in remote areas. In a sense, Acre appears to have supported the development of, of a separate space for collective action among the IPLC representatives and their constituents, just as it appears Jambi created that space for women. So in conclusion, um, high PLCs need to be able to work with their own constituency to organize and build counter power. So back to our imaginaries, if we're all in this together, well, we know we're not really, um, but in case we still need to work together, right, <laughs> then what exactly is the work that we're doing and in whose interest? So to be part of the power with of a forum, IPLCs have to build their own power with among IPLCs, women, and remember Fox's findings uh, around support for second, secondary level organizations, collective titling, um, and then build support with allies. So what can we do about all of this? Drop in the bucket probably, um, but we've been working on a number of tools that have, removed, have emerged from this research. They were designed with forum members in the case of the first one, how we are doing um, in Indonesia and Peru. It's aimed at developing group reflection on MSFs. The first one was adapted uh, and adopted by Peru's protected area service for the co-management committees of their, of their protected areas um, and should be implemented in all 70 protected areas, hopefully starting next year. The second one was developed specifically at the quest of the Peruvian Indigenous Women's Association, ONAMIAP, and the emphasis that they put on this was to the understanding of participation of women in indigenous territorial governance. And we haven't piloted this one yet, the other one we have, um, but we will be piloting this one this year. Of course, these are just tools to change the way MSFs or MSPs work. They still have to be part of a broader strategy, um, but perhaps they're a step in the right direction. And to the extent that they're developed by and for IPLCs themselves, or in this case, indigenous rural women, perhaps this is something different. Um, a third tool is more of a guide based on the analysis of inclusion in the MSF literature and interviews with over 50 leaders from around the world. Um, this graphic is from that tool and it's currently in press. It should be out hopefully by the end of the month. I think the graphic is a really nice summary of st thinking strategically for inclusion and building space for collective action and empowerment of IPs and women. It ranges from the short-term goals, from very practical support to voice, getting women at the table means you have to have childcare, <laughs> really basic stuff to the collective action and empowerment from structure to capacities. And I think there's um, a, quite a bit of food for thought in this graphic alone and in the, the document itself, which will be out soon. So in general, the results, the opinions of IPLCs uh, are more positive than we expected given what we know about the broader analysis. It means that IPLCs are mostly getting something out of the forums and participating may be better than not participating, again, for those who chose to participate. It doesn't mean, however, that the underlying power structures are changing or that they are building 
as Combas and McLaughlin state, the resources, assets, and capabilities they need to exercise greater choice and control over their own development and to hold decision makers to account. It doesn't mean that just because people feel like equals, which of course we hope they do, that the forum is making it possible to have voice for those who are marginalized and that they are being empowered. And this may be why more than half of IPLCs participating in multi-stakeholder platforms hold out for the idea that something besides the forum, their own collective organizations, may be a better option. And I'm just gonna stop there. I wanna thank my, my research team. My uh, co-coordinator on all of this work was Juan Pablo Sarmiento from Peru. And all the other names are there, people who worked in the different countries and on uh, the tools as well. And that's the end. Thank you. <coughs> Great, thank you very much, Anne. Um, yeah, a uh, lot of material to discuss here. Uh, and if people would like to make comments, please raise your hand or write things in the chat. And uh, and let me know if you want me to read it or, or preferably if if you uh, raise your hand and would like to speak yourself, that would be that would be great. So it takes a little while for people to come up with their questions. So while you're thinking of that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll make some comments and questions. Really fascinating study. Uh, and, and as you said, kind of in a sense, sort of surprisingly positive results um, in some ways. But also interesting that, that they were positive even in cases where the platform was not working very well. So, so there are high expectations, as you say. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, is um is there a component or maybe a future step to your study to to look um in some way at impact of these platforms you know in terms of so there's there's the perceptions of how effective they are i mean i have you know personal observation noticed that those who actually participate um often do tend to be more enthusiastic about about platforms than those who are not either they elected not to participate because they're not enthusiastic or um, or they didn't know about it or they were excluded or, or um, yeah, just uh, they can't see all this trust building that's going on inside. So so is there a part of the study where, where you can, I know it's difficult because the cases are so different, but where you can sort of look at what sort of impacts this is having outside of the process. So that's actually a really good question because originally, I mean, the study was supposed to be of the equity and effectiveness of forums, but what we found is that it's very, very difficult to study the effectiveness of forums um, or even really study equity impacts of a forum separate from everything else that's going on in a place, right? So. I would say that in a couple cases, we probably have more information on that because, for example, the Acre Mato Grosso were, were someone's dissertation. So, you know, we have a lot, uh, a, a richer data set that, you know, she did a lot more work than just what she did for us. Um, but in general, I mean, in this learning group as well, we've been discussing and, and a couple other places, we've been, we're also in a multi stakeholder platform learning group. Um, this, this issue of figuring out the effect of a forum is, it's very hard in a time scale. It's very, I mean, it's obviously one thing to say they achieve their objectives if their objectives are quantifiable, right? Yes, they had X number of meetings. Yes, they maybe even got the plan, except or in some cases, I think the Acre plan was accepted. The Mato Grosso one, I think never was. Um, it has to be approved by parliament. I mean, these kinds of things, right? So is that, that's a thing, but it's still not saying, did you actually improve you know, land management, sustainability. And then the, the real difficulty of it all is the, attribute, the attribution issue, right? How, what do you attribute to the forum versus what do you attribute to, attribute to everything else that's going on? And our study was really a, a pretty small, short, and people went in for what it was like six weeks or two months was the most they had in the field anywhere. Um, and it wasn't that kind of study. It was much more of an idea, a, the sense was to get a sense of what we could learn from this. There is other work going on through this um, Partnerships 2030 at GIZ, which we're part of that platform. And there is a, a university study that they're working with a number of platforms who are trying to explain their impact better. 
Um, and I think the ILC is also doing the same thing with their platforms, the International Land Coalition, which is built around these national platforms. And everybody, since every donor wants us to prove impact, it's in everyone's interest to start trying to understand how we can do that better and how we can explain the impact of forums. So there's research going on on how to, how to understand and, and gather information on the impact of forums. I'm not sure so how much that it relates to the equity versus the effectiveness questions, but um, there's it's it's a it's a challenge. I mean, in a sense, the everything we did is perceptions. Perceptions of all of these things, and where people said yes, the forum was successful, we asked them why, and said, do you have data on that? And they asked, we asked for reports, but it's still not, you know, going out into the field and seeing did this forum actually change uh, land use? Great, thanks. Yes, that that's the that's the trillion dollar question or what have you for sure. But yeah, really, really interesting. So I see we have a comment from uh, Rito. Would would you like to to speak or I can read it? Yeah, you can read it. Oh, I'm not but, sure my microphone is fine. Is, oh, it's is it right. Yeah, it's Good. working. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so my question was about. Um, in the entire talk, it was about inclusion, and we are all in this together. Uh, so is there a case where some stakeholders should be avoided from the table uh, because they can be disruptive or uh, break trust in other communities? So you have, or sh I mean, some forum might be better with several sessions, but not bringing all stakeholders together at the same table at the first step. So do you have any comment or idea about that? Yes, I mean, I think that's a very good point. I mean, there is a, there, we saw in several forums that they kept certain actors out of the forum specifically because they, they were too difficult to work with um, or they just didn't think they could, they were quite up to the challenge and they didn't want them to change the nature of the discussions and the focus of the forum, which was towards sustainability. So for example, not bringing in miners in, in the mining sector in Madre de Dios or not bringing in, in, um, in one region we had, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we had uh, indigenous people actually quite well represented in the forum, but they didn't wanna bring in the migrant communities that were sometimes occupying their land or putting pressure on them to, to sell land and things like that. Um, the, the interesting case, I mean, there's a whole discussion as to whether should we bring the, the polluters to the table? Should we bring the deforesters to the table or should we you know, fight them or what exactly? And in the case of, uh, the, the interesting case of the Green Municipalities Program is that it was the one, it, one that really dug in with the, uh, the companies and the people, the big drivers of deforestation and I think there's a, a blog just came out uh, again saying how great that program is. I didn't get to see it. Somebody sent me the link this morning saying another one on the, the other narrative, which is that it's been such an incredible success. But our understanding of what happened is that there was a lot of, that the, the whole way, so this is based on Brazil's policy of registering land um, in which then also requires um, it's complicated, but there's a whole land registration and then incentives that come from the state if you keep your deforestation rates below certain levels. So the green municipalities, you have to get your forest cover back up high enough in order to qualify for the credits again. And it's all very complicated. But the arguments of people that we interviewed, uh, both participants and non-participants who knew the situation well, were very concerned about the amount of land being claimed by, so the titling of these lands, the registration was done entirely by word of mouth without any requirements to provide GPS uh, uh, locations and assure that you weren't on someone else's land. So there's a understanding that's actually been quite a bit of land encroachment. And it's, this is a very violent region. I think Brazil has one of the highest cases in the world of, of environmental defenders being assassinated. I mean, this is, a, this is a complex place to be working and only bringing in the, the deforesters to the table seems to have been 
um, well, they got something done and some people believe that that's been, that's been working, but there's also a lot of evidence that it hasn't really been working. And the, you know, you saw the greenwashing comments from some people. Um, I suppose maybe a, a few years down the road, we'll know what, what the actual fallout was of this, but certainly the other people who occupy a very large part of the land there were not at the table um, and felt very much excluded from the process as a whole. So that's, and it's, it's a sensitive one actually, and we've even been careful about uh, publicizing it because it is so um, kind of publicly uh, celebrated. Uh, it's won awards. So to bring up this other side was seen as both risky and problematic in a lot of ways. Um, include, yeah, anyway, complicated stuff. But yes, I think that's a question. <laughs> it's a question. And I think, I mean, if you want to try to influence the behavior of the drivers, people driving, I think it's going to be a, it's a, it's going to be something that has to be analyzed as a strategy in, in a particular location. What can you manage? What can't you manage? Who should be at the table? Who should be, who should be the, the target of the people at the table versus at the table? And how do you manage that? But I think that's all part of what involves a really theory, serious thinking about your theory of change and how change happens and who you're going to change and why and where the resistance is. Yeah, just just following up on that. And I mean, the, the people that weren't at the table were those the sort of the smaller landholders, etc, that you were talking about before, because, you know, this might be an illustration if that's the case um, of how if equity is not part of the objective, the objective is slowing deforestation. Wow, you know, I'm not sure it actually achieved that either. That's another matter. But in terms of accelerating on land titling, you know, I mean, I think there's evidence that it has done, had some impact on deforestation. But, but, it, but in terms of land titling, you know, excluding the small actors could be quite convenient if 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 equity is not a central goal, perhaps. Except that what people claim happened is that yeah. then those lands were actually being claimed by the people who were at the table and overlapping the lands of the indigenous people in local communities. And they're also not smallholders. They own a very large portion of the land, often without secure rights and maybe less secure rights now because of the Bolsonaro presidency and everything that that's brought. Right. But, but I'm just thinking that, you know, <laughs> to what extent in the green municipalities policy was it stated that that this should, you know, the objective was really around um, an equitable distribution of, of land title and how much of it was more about directly focused on arresting deforestation and land registration. Yeah, absolutely right. It's not, it, I'm sure equity was not part of their, um, their goals. Yeah, right. but by, by not having any con conception of it, they probably drove greater inequity. Yeah, yeah. Right. Great, so another um, question from JT Erbau. Would you like to better state your question than I could? <laughs> <laughs> sure, uh, thanks so much for a great presentation and, and thanks to OCTF for hosting, this is great. And I'm, a, I'm an alum, so it's great to be back virtually. Um, so Anne, I was curious if the MSPs that you were analyzing were convened to influence a specific policy process, perhaps like a, a management plan forest management plan, something like that. And if so, might that have affected some of the participant responses or perceptions about efficacy um, of, of, the, of their participation in the, in the multi-stakeholder platform? I'm not sure I completely understand your question. I mean, the forums were all quite different. Um, one was to develop the entire, or two of them were the, the ecological economic zoning for the entire state of two Brazilian states. Um, the ones that focused on participatory forest management, there were actually three, I think, the two in Ethiopia and one in Peru. The, so there's definitely, um, you know, depending on what the forum was trying to do, people do react differently to it. Like if they see it as a place for education and learning how, like one of the indigenous participants of the forum in Ucayali was very happy because they got a forest management plan out of it. 
but most of the others felt like they were being pushed to do something they didn't really understand and you know didn't really want to work with the private sector others thought it was great to have the private sector at the table because they you know could work on this management plan together so it's it's pretty varied um, and I definitely think that the content and the actual goals of the forums them, itself have a lot of influence. And I really couldn't get into that here, but I think that the, the case studies are more helpful to see all of that. And again, the International Forest Review next issue ought to be a special issue with, um, I think we have six case studies and one cross-cutting article on the interviews with the organizers of the forums. So hopefully that'll help answer your question. Yeah, great, thank you. Sure. Great. So I see Mary. Mary Menton has a question. Comment. Mary. Mary. <laughs> oh, she can't speak. Okay. So I will um, speak uh, for her. If yeah. That's all right. It says um, great talk. Do you get a sense that who creates or initiates the multi stakeholder forum? influences the extent to which equity is considered government versus ngo versus grassroots and how much influence do the funders have very good question and we're working on that paper right now <laughs> we've just started to pull out the data comparing the who organized it and who and the results so we will know more about that in about a month but right and Possibly, probably, but I can't I can't tell you right now yet what the data shows. <laughs> Great. Hi, Carol. I see you there too. You popped up. Um, <laughs> so hi. Um, Great. I think it's so so nice to see everyone. Um, I well. So while people are coming up with um, with other comments, oh, Mary says looks forward to reading the paper that you're producing. Um, <laughs> So uh, are thinking of other comments. I have another one that, that I've been puzzling sort of in an ongoing way around um, relating this all to let's say Brazil's red plus strategy. So for example, you know, the green municipalities program, the soy moratorium, et cetera, to, to what extent it's been associated with reduced deforestation and is qualifying for red plus payments where do where does the safeguard question fit in? So let's say hypothetically that that this would count towards red plus say, um, payments. Presumably, if there's no consideration of equity or who's being impacted, that would be violating the safeguards. Is that something that's discussed? Because it it just seems like a lot of the international discussion about red plus and I mean around Brazil and, and reduction of deforestation, the safeguards are just not really discussed very much. In theory, <laughs> in theory, they should not get funding if the safeguards are not in place. Um, and of course, yeah, I read specifically, uh, Brazil specifically. So I did comment this was part of our red, under our red umbrella, but we tend to be the group, the team within the, the NORAD work that kind of goes off into lots of other interesting things that have, to, that in our view have very much to do with how land use decisions are made and are very relevant to the red agenda, but not even many of these spots were red projects, for example, um, just to know that they just, they were where there were forums. There weren't enough red forums to study. We, we tried that option at the beginning, but there just weren't enough. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's actually, <clears throat> Assuming we get the funding, we're still waiting, like should hear this week, I think from NORAD, the next round of our research is looking at safeguards and their implementation. Um, and actually what we're going to be doing is looking at various safeguard standards because there's a huge span too. I mean, Cancun may be the minimum standard, uh, which requires there be safeguard standards that don't even really need to be reported on, right? But there has to be something. Um, to what has just been put out by the Rights and Resources Initiative and IPMG, the Indigenous uh, People's Major Group with the Global Landscape Forum, which is called the Gold Standard, which I suspect is the most um, stringent idea of what a safeguards ought to look like. Um, it's beyond safeguards, really. It's you know, it's more proactive and positive than than, than just protecting, which is kind of how I see safeguards, right? Um, and anyway, we'll be looking at a number of those and how they're actually um, playing out in practice. It's a really, really small grant this year for our, for our portion, but um, we'll be do something on, doing something on that in uh, Indonesia, Peru, and Ethiopia. 
Yeah, I mean, the fact that it, it's a small part really says something interesting. <laughs> well, it has to do more with the NORAD funding in general. And I mean, our my piece has always been small. I came, I'm always coming a little bit sideways to the red discussion through the equity and uh, justice and gender side. So it's not as, I mean, I'm, I'm, we got a big team at C4, so I'm just one, I'm just one person. Yes. So more questions or comments? Don't be shy. It's a great opportunity to discuss any of these issues. We've touched on a lot of um, possible threads to follow up on. So I could ask my, um, my research assistant, Nicole is on the call and is mentioning that uh, there are a couple of things that, that might be interesting to comment on. Would you like to, to say those to the full group, Nicole? Yeah, yeah thank you, Anne. Uh, Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. My name is Nicole, and as Anne said, I am working as a research assistant with her. And well, I have been looking through the database, and uh, as Anne said, we still have to, to look some more into the data to uh, have some more conclusive results. But what we have seen uh, so far is that, for example, conflict management really helps in, in the MSF not to address inequality, because if we have people that might not have the same interests, like sustainable interests and all of these, like some people just exclude, excluded them. But we have seen that in the forums that were actually uh, having good results, they had conflict management strategies to address these kind of problems. Like what happens if there are conflicting interests or what happens if someone uh, was initially thought that it's better to be excluded. So we have seen that conflict management is actually something really important to include in your MSF. And also this conclusion drives from the results in San Martin, where we have seen that the local communities were uh, sometimes excluded from the MSF because they were thought to be like in, in invaders of these lands. Uh, and really like the people, when we interviewed these non-participants, they were saying things like, we have been here before this area was created, we are not invaders, they are inventing things about us, they are saying we are terrorists, and we are really looking forward to have a sustainable management in this land, but if, if people think like that about us, we are not uh, welcome to be in this forum. So. I think conflict management is something essential to be included, and we haven't seen this was included in most MSFs. And then another thing that we have seen also that was very important was monitoring participation itself. Because, for example, we, we, when we presented the results of these forums, we have seen that there, the organizers, the participants were actually interested on um, improving the equity or the participation in their forums. So we actually developed a tool to monitor uh, how equitable is going the forum, if the if participation is working. And uh, so we, we have that tool and it's called How Are We Doing? And it, it's planned to be um, to be applied in multi-stakeholder forums to like see how participation is going and uh, so people can reflect themselves uh, what they can do to improve the equity in their forums. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to add, I forget who asked the question about um, whether the people driving, like who should be at the forum and should the people who are more problematic with drivers of deforestation or discriminate against indigenous peoples or whatever, should they be there? And the tool actually was des was designed to assure that the forum members are are thinking about that. And so the, the tool is designed with a number of statements that people agree with, disagree with, and so on, but then there's also a reflection section so that every question has a series of questions to consider. So, um, We've, you know, we've been working with the one in Madre de Dios to consider, to seriously consider 
needing perhaps to use this forum to have the other people at the table who aren't there. And, and that, I mean, the questions allow them to think through why aren't they there? Why do we not want them here? And, and just make sure that it's on the table and not just something somebody decided or just never happened or never actually got reflected on. Um, yeah, Great. Nicole, Nicole's our database guru. She's the one who's who's taking this massive quantity of mostly qualitative data and <laughs> trying to dig through it for us. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Well, there, there's been a number of questions um, now too. So uh, new questions. I, I missed one. Sorry, Nicole uh, Chabonet, do you, would you like to ask your question? I think you're on mute still, are you? Um, I see you there, but I don't hear you. Can anyone else hear? Do you hear Anne? No. Um, let's see. Well, I could read it out loud. Yeah, I'll just read out the question here. Um, thanks for your presentation. Could you please share with us some of the most critical challenges and or lessons learned? Mm -hmm. um, and thank you oh, for your presentation. Good. Excellent. Okay. Hello. Hello. We hear you Can now. you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, there might be a lag because I spoke a, a few seconds ago. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you and sorry about that. So thank you, Anne, for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us some of the most critical challenges and or lessons learned uh, with implementing the MSPs that consider a landscape approach. So beyond these political territories that often limit the the inclusion of the broader landscape and the ecological processes that we're seeking to conserve. Thank you. Thanks. So we actually haven't, we haven't looked at specifically the landscapes of or compared the types of forums based on the landscapes they were addressing. Um, you know, whether they were, I mean, in Acre, Mato Grosso, Pará, these are all statewide, very large Brazilian states. Um, and I guess I'm not entirely sure what you mean by political territories, because I think of landscape as also politically defined. Um, they don't have to be, but the ones we, we prefer to work in were ones, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted a government of, to be on the forums is because we didn't want just a project that was out in some, in a particular landscape that wasn't connected to a, to a government or an institutionalized approach. So, so that's, there's a couple of questions in there from me to you. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the difference between a landscape and political. And again, I'm, I would say that in terms of looking at our territories, we have not done that specific analysis to compare results or challenges based on the actual definition of the landscape. I think there are probably too many confounding factors um, to separate those out. Yes, it's true. There's, it's a big challenge. So that's why I was bringing the question to you. I, what I mean by political territories is that often um, in a broader landscape where you need to conserve different areas of the ecosystems, there are territories that have political boundaries. For example, if you're working on a landscape between Peru and Bolivia, so how to bridge across those political barriers to really bring together stakeholders uh, that are uh, linked to that landscape in particular. And I know that the concept of landscape is, is pretty complex and difficult to manage, but um, I was wondering if you had any insights in that since it's a challenge that in my work I'm currently facing. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I actually don't think any of ours really were crossing political boundaries. We don't have any um, transnational or, and even the, I'm trying to think, maybe the watershed management project in Indonesia would be the only one that goes, that literally covers a whole watershed. But we ended up focusing in one arena because otherwise it was way beyond our, the scope of what we could do. Um, in the project. So we probably don't have the kind of data you would be looking for, 
but we do, so we are starting this new project that's based on the um, European Union's call for landscapes for the future, I believe it's called. And C4 is running what they're calling the central component, which is supposed to be sort of helping these 23 projects in 23 countries uh, develop, a, it's an integrated landscape approach basically and trying to understand what that means, um, study it, make sure that, you know, we have some indicators to see how it, how it works and that how the different uh, projects are actually proposing that, uh, how, they, how they conceive integrated landscape approach and then to sort of developing a community of practice around these 23 countries around the world. Um, and helping them with some technical assistance. So that's just launching right now um, this year. And I know in that case, there's at least at least two that are beyond political boundaries, one in the Caribbean and one in, uh, that's I believe on the Brazil-Paraguay border perhaps. Anyway, we're, we're really just getting it started. So we might have more about that in the future, but it's not about, it's not about multi-stakeholder forums. Right, it's about, but those obviously are in almost all of these. <laughs> Everybody's got a forum. Um, so, but it is about looking at, at beyond political boundaries. I know that um, there's also some work, I think it's with ECRAF on some political boundaries in Asia um, where they've been looking across. But anyway, if you wanted to email me, I could, I could maybe connect you with a couple of people who might be working more specifically across, uh, across national okay. boundaries, for example. Thank you so much, Anne. Thanks. Sure. Great, thanks. So I I see now that there is a question from Carol Colfer. Would you like to ask your question, Carol? I was just wondering if you, ha if you had done anything formal in terms of comparing those MSFs that were uh, where people were invited versus those ones that uh, grew sort of spontaneously on their own, because that was a big issue in ACM was which way we should go, you know? Yeah, no, all of these were invited spaces. All of these were ones that were top down and that's um, kind of the ones we wanted to focus on to see because that's the vast majority <laughs> around that's being called for in these climate initiatives and restoration initiatives and so on that we wanted to see if they can be become grounded perhaps and uh, have ownership taken locally. Um, so no, we, we didn't really study those. We are working though through, through PIM, which is a policies, institutions and markets at um, a CG program to, with the Foundation for Ecological Security in India, which is a, a massive, just amazing project that's really working on um, landscape approaches with grass. I mean, you know, India, everything is multiplied by 10 factor of 10 to the number of people involved. And it's what they're doing is really building very much from the bottom up. Um, and now, I mean, the thing with ACM was that it really was so local that it was hard to figure out sometimes to how to connect with institutions. These are the opposite that they're having, you know, connecting with local people often means on their terms. So how do you really bridge that? And FES, FES is trying to do that from the bottom up, doing, building those bridges, um, upwards and they seem to be uh, doing some good work around it. And uh, other organizations are working a lot on that, including through PIM with um, collaborating for resistance, for resilience, excuse me, um, uh, run by Blake Ratner. So you might wanna look into his work. And he's also with, working with the International Land Coalition um, where this is also a big, a big issue for them is their, their national platforms and how they build those platforms to be bottom up and connected and impactful. So that's, and I think there's some, probably some research gonna come out of the, looking at the, the ILC platforms comparatively. So that might be a source for information. Just following on that, um, and did, were you saying that the Jambi case sort of was something that started outside or imposed outside, but then took root on its own, kind of carried on with its own momentum or? Uh, my understanding, so it was an ACM project, which is bottom up, but of course you're still having it, researchers coming in to facilitate this bottom up approach. And my understanding is that, I'm, I'm not sure that the forum continues to meet, but that the people who were part of that forum and the dynamics generated from that forum have continued to um, build on the sort of the, I mean, it ended at what in 2006 or something. I mean, it was quite a long time ago that it ended, um, but they've, 
continue to work on trying to get the community forest um, protected and then get it. I believe that what happened fairly recently is that they actually got a title to it, but I might have the terminology wrong um, being Indonesia, which I don't not quite know as closely. But again, um, that's coming out in an article as well in the, <laughs> in the special issue. And it's, it's mentioned this ongoing work and more follow on successes, which may or may not have, you know, can be directly attributed to the ACM project, but certainly was part of building capacity and trust and empowerment of this uh, group of people. Great. So comment from Rito, did you want to comment again or? Or just an interest or um, was it? No, no, thank you. Oh, go ahead. No, yeah. no. No, it was just uh, very interesting. I was just expressing myself. I see Nicole has her hand raised again. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, hand raised. Excellent. Nicole. Yeah, thank you. No, I just wanted to add that we have this question on the database that is, were you invited? Uh, how were you like invited to participate? And when I was exploring that question, I haven't gone through the whole database, but what I have seen is that um, really most people were, like for the government, it was almost everyone was mandated to go uh, from the government people, but from like local communities, they were invited to. But then I have seen for the indigenous people, I think it was in Mato Grosso. I'm not sure about this, I, I, I need to check, but there were some people that said that they were not initially included and that they asked for inclusion. So yeah, that also happened. Um, but yeah, and I think it's important to see that the government, they are like most of the people from the government, they are just mandated to go. It's not like a, they are willing to. Well, from the local people, it's more like a will to. Uh, or it also happens that uh, they are, they were representative, the representants of an organization and that's why they were there because they were like, I don't know, the leader of an indigenous organization. So they uh, usually people uh, from the local communities that have like leadership position was, were also the ones invited. Interestingly, in the case of Jambi where we find more equity, um, more local community people were involved. Like they, they and they, they say to represent their themselves they weren't in representation of someone else. And I think that's also an important finding, but also it's something that in a, in a higher level uh, forum, right? Like as in Agrid, where they are, it's a whole state, it's more difficult to do that. Yeah, important uh, factor of size there for sure, yeah. Great, let's see. Um, okay, anyone else with their hand up? Uh, no, we're, we're coming to, actually, perfect. We came to, to 5.30. That seems like a pretty good uh, time to maybe thank everyone for their participation, unless there's any last minute. Feel free to just sort of speak out too if I'm missing something because I don't always see your comments, but uh, I think that was a great discussion and, and a great talk. And, and thanks so much to everybody for, yeah, for being here and uh, sharing your ideas. And I really look forward to seeing you in future OCTF events and elsewhere. So, okay, well, with that, we'll close the session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everybody for coming.